So, welcome everybody, Professor Patzelt, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear Deputy Director Lanzi, welcome to our event. Um, it seems so that President Macro tries to steal the show from us, but uh, we are doing our utmost to compensate you with this. And I also would like to greet everybody sitting behind the screens in home, uh, following our event online on Facebook. Welcome everybody. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Ben Bauer. I'm the director of the newly founded German-Hungarian Institute for European Cooperation. This institute has been formed one year ago in order to enhance bilateral relations, bilateral di dialogue between Germany, German-speaking countries, and Hungar Hungary. It's a so-called single-issue think tank, if you might use this word, um, strengthening the relations with expertise, knowledge, contacts. We publish analysis. We are doing our utmost in the research, everything that is influencing the bilateral relations. And of course, we also organize events, conferences. We, have, we take part in the academic activities of the Matthias Kovinus Collegium. You might be aware of that there is the visiting fellowship program. And in the framework of this visiting fellowship program, we have the honor to have Professor Patzelt, Professor Amritus from the University of Dresden, here with us at the Matthias Kovinus Collegium. He is here for a half year period. He started in September. He was born in 1953 in Passau, Bavaria, studied political sciences, history, and sociology in, at the Ludwig Maximilians University at Munich. He accomplished PhD studies as of 1984 in Passau and completed 1990 his habilitation also at the University of Passau. Between 91 and 2019, he was professor of political systems and comparative politics in Dresden in Saxony. He's one of the well, most well-known political scientists in Germany with a huge number of publications and a long-standing expertise in German politics, advisor to the Christian Democrat Union and a frequent commentator in German television. Three months ago, September 26, there have been the federal elections in Germany and since then on, many things changed in Germany. Professor Patzelt, if you look a little bit to the last three months you have been here now, at the Matthias Kovinus Collegium. What did you witness here in Hungary? How are your experiences here in Budapest? And what is different in politics to what you knew from your own experience in Germany? Well, to begin with, I've been warmly welcomed by your institute and by the MCC, and therefore I had a chance to accommodate quickly, to feel well, and to get interesting uh, discourse partners. I was able to speak with many interesting persons to get a full picture of Hungary. See, back in Germany, Talking or reading about Germany, uh, about Hungary, is something like, well, a leap of faith. You have to decide whom to believe. You don't get a feeling for what reality in Hungary is really like. So it was for me a very uh, fascinating experience to compare what I see here, what I learn from the people with whom I'm able to talk about the Hungarian situation. And what I learned are two things. First of all, people in Hungary sometimes are as split over the evaluation of the Hungarian situation as people in Germany are. Only the percentages are a bit different. At a normal party in Germany talking about Hungary, you figure out that something like 80% will say, well, this is an authoritarian regime. It's a problem to live there, in particular if you're in opposition. Here, my feeling is that the percentage is about something like 55 to, uh, to, to, to 45, something mm -hmm. like that. So this is different. But the split over the character of the political system, the accents put on the descriptions of reality, uh, that's quite, quite similar. Uh, one of my experiences here has been when I was talking with representatives of civil society of uh, critical critical civil society, civil society associations was, after they had raised all the critical points, and no need to repeat them right here, I asked them bluntly the question, and now, generally speaking, is Hungary a dictatorship? <laughs> Some seconds of reflection, and then the reply came, no, that's too harsh. That's too harsh. It's not a dictatorship yet, nevertheless. So, this is the best possible description I can give so far about my experiences and the differences. Oh, there was a question as to the differences, and I do not want to be silent on that. There are significant differences. 
And I do not want to oversimplify, but I want to be quite clear on that. In Hungary, it is quite common to say, well, I love Hungary. Hungary, that's a great people, small people, but a great people with a great, sometimes tragic history, with an important culture which needs to be transmitted into the future. Therefore, we want to cultivate Hungarian culture, and we do not want to change this culture by immigration. In Germany, it's quite different. Is there something like German culture? No. Mm. No, you, you can't find a German culture. You can find a Bavarian, a Saxonian culture. And if there was a German culture, it is nothing worthwhile to transmit into the future to convey to the next generations. It leads to Nazism. Therefore, the feeling that their own nation has some value is much more important for Hungarians mm. than it is for Germans, and this seems to be the basic point, the, the basic difference which spreads out to many other differences. Since you are here, since uh, these three months uh, passed, the political landscape of Germany radically changed. What has happened in the federal election September 26? What was the reason for that? And would you have anticipated that there would be such a coalition in the federal level in Germany? No, I did not anticipate that. And since I made some predictions about the electoral outcome, everybody can know that I did not uh, predict this coalition. What has happened? First of all, the CDU had to get aware of the fact that all the public support in the media, in public discourse and so on, was never meant for the CDU. The support was meant for Angela Merkel, who herself was supported in particular by those who are more leaning towards the Green Party, towards the Social Democratic Party. Uh, German journalists, to a significant part, uh, are uh, sympathizers of the Green Party and the Social Democratic Party. So the sympathy for Angela Merkel were due to the fact that very often she made political decisions in the direction preferred by the Social Democratic Party and the Greens. And the Christian Democrats, for whatever reason, for a long while believed that they are strong because there is Angela Merkel, and they would be strong even after Angela Merkel leaving the top position in Germany. And what has changed is Angela Merkel is no longer there, therefore the CDU gets aware of the fact that this party is, to put it bluntly, intellectually naked, without really substantial issues to stand for, without orientation. The Social Democratic Party, in turn, well, this party was imprisoned, <laughs> confined to 16% at most, and they were able to rise. Why? Well, first of all, the sympathies moved from Angela Merkel to somebody else, to mm -hmm. whom? First to the Green Party, but when Angela Merkel showed that she is not that miraculous political figure that the press had made out of her, the sympathies were driven away from the Green Party, from Annalena Baerbock, and they went to Olaf Scholz. Olaf Scholz, on his, on his part, he showed himself as the legitimate heir of Angela Merkel, even coping her uh, postures. So all the trust invested in Angela Merkel was transferred to Olaf Scholz. And last thing, we have something new in this new traffic light coalition. See, since the Green Party came into existence many years ago, the Green Party and the Liberals were like, let me say, cats and dogs to each other. They mm. never could smell each other. Mm. Even on electoral evening, you could see that the top politicians of these two parties wanted mm -hmm. to get on both the same political boat to govern together, and together they're stronger than the Social Democratic Party. So something new is beginning, whether it is good for Germany or detrimental, well, this we will see, but the political landscape has dramatically changed with a weak, collapsed CDU, with a SPD which looks stronger than this party really is, and with a lot of hope for transforming Germany into whatever direction. I failed to uh, introduce in the very beginning the possibility to you that you can have the questions in the end. So after our first round of questions, 
uh, prepared by myself, you will have the possibility to also ask questions to Professor Patzelt. So the floor will be later yours, but I would like to go through some, some topics that we discussed in the forehand. So it was actually a record number of uh, members in the Bundestag this time. There's a record number of parties represented in the Bundestag, but we have also a record number of parties governing. Never before there was a three-party coalition in Germany on the federal level, and uh, many analysts uh, have uh, anticipated very long-lasting coalition talks. But in the end of the day, the three parties, the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Liberal FDP, came to a very qu quick conclusion. Have you been surprised by this very this rapidity of the talks and that they came so quickly to, to a solution. I've not really been surprised by that. Mm -hmm. the, the comparison usually includes the last coalition talks between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, which followed a, a failure in forging a coalition with the Christian Democrats, the Green, and the Liberals. The difference is, at those times, Christian Democrats and SPD or CDU, FDP and Green Party, these parties did not really like to govern together. Mm -hmm. The liberals were skeptical when they were, so to speak, forced or nearly forced into a coalition with CDU and the Greens. And the SPD was so reluctant, this party really did not want to govern as the junior partner of the CDU. This time, the situation was absolutely different. The Green Party and the liberals, as I put it before, they really wanted to return back to political power, to the cabinet table, and the Social Democrats were so happy that after so many years mm -hmm. they could uh, again uh, have the chancellorship of the Federal Republic in their control that all these three parties really wanted to come together, and this is what they practiced. And, uh, since public opinion was very much in favor of exactly this coalition, there were no mental obstacles uh, which needed to be surmounted. So it was not really a surprise. The people talk, analysts talk sometimes about the radical shift, but in the end of the day, we forgot to mention that in the last 23 years, with the exception of four years, the Social Democrats did govern the country, 12 years in the Grand Coalition. So that's also belonging, I think, to this uh, when we analyze this. But uh, my next question is about the liberal democratic FDP, the liberal, civic liberal FDP. Uh, always uh, understood itself as a part of the center right, but now they are governing with the rather leftish, uh, left wing, the left liberal green coalition. How can they preserve their policies, their character? And when we look on the numbers, uh, Olaf Scholz was voted with 395 votes, but the coalition comprises 416 MPs. So obviously 21 did not vote for Olaf Scholz. Is this the first sign of a possible dispute within the governing coalition, or would it be too early to state this? I think that's too early to uh, take this as an indicator of lacking stability of the coalition. It has been quite common in, in German history that as soon as a coalition has a uh, broad margin, uh, no small minority, then a couple or even many mm -hmm. of the members of parliament uh, express or used to express the feeling that they are not satisfied because they have not become ministers mm -hmm. or the government is too leftist or not leftist enough, what, whatever, that so they express based on the security, on the assuredness that this chancellor will be elected, their own disagreement. As to the role of the FDP in the new government, we need not to forget, we must not forget, that the FDP has for many years uh, been in a coalition with the Social Democratic Party. This is nothing new, and there is significant compatibility between the Liberals and the Social Democrats. And uh, since the Greens and the Liberals have decided uh, to behave in a more friendly way, to try uh, to cultivate some kind of uh, cooperative mood together. Uh, the basis for this coalition is here. It remains true that the visions of what the role of government should be in a modern democracy differ widely between the Greens and the Social Democrats on the one side and the FDP on the other side. Since uh, Greens and Social Democrats still have the vision that the state should be in control, the state knows, or government mm -hmm. knows better uh, what is good for a society in ecological terms, social terms, sometimes even in economic terms, whereas the standard liberal approach is give individuals and and civil society as society organizes herself as much freedom, as much uh, maneuvering space as possible, uh, rely on the soundness, on the rationality of individual and collective actors and do not put all your confidence into the government. So 
this is still a split, and we will need to wait uh, to whom Chancellor Scholz will give his support. If Chancellor Scholz uh, works or shapes his coalition in a rational way, he will see that he will be stronger when supporting the FDP vis-a-vis -vis the leftist wing of the Social mm -hmm. Democratic, vis-a-vis uh, the leftist wing of the Green Party, when he supports the liberal approach to policy mm -hmm. making. Uh, but then he will have to come to grips with the party internal pressure he will certainly receive. So much will depend on the chancellor, as it usually is the case in Germany. But now to come to the core topic of our tonight's event is about the coalition agreement in detail and what it consists of. So to talk more in detail, the coalition agreement has actually 177 pages with an ambitious reform agenda. What are, your, in your eyes, the most important points in this agreement, in this program? Well, one perspective is my own perspective, and the other one is the perspective of the coalition partners. Uh, luckily enough, in some dimensions, they are really congruent. What seems to be the most important thing for the coalition partners is to, well, reshape or to modernize German climate policies, uh, pol policies uh, the supply of energy in Germany, the, tr the transformation of the German economic or uh, e ecological system towards renewable energies. Uh, the leader of the, of the Green Party, Annalena Baerbock, used to say in a, in a television show ahead of the, of the elections, well, this new government needs to be a climate government, mm -hmm. as though you could govern the climate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this was not what she meant. She, she meant we have to, to protect the climate. So this should be the core issue. And if you look at the distribution of the, of the portfolios, mm -hmm. you see that everything which has to do with climate, energy policies, and so on, is now in the hand of the Green Party. So this is really important for them. Uh, the other issue is migration policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany should become an open, or should remain, should stay, should go on being an open country. And for this reason, we need to create a multicultural, a multi-ethnic society. We should not close our borders vis-a-vis -vis, uh, migrants. We should not follow the bad example of Hungary and of Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, we should give a good example of how it, of how it is if a country really uh, is attached to humanitarian values. And here, the core ideological points of this government are, are concerned. Of course, the government uh, thinks of uh, modernizing German society, and in fact, uh, we have a lot of things to do in terms of digitalization, or of all these instruments which impede structural innovation in Germany. But here, there is one of the contradictions in this coalition. Mm -hmm. Uh, our problems with establishing new infrastructure from uh, train stations to airports to windmills for providing us with uh, renewable energies, all these planning and uh, concretizing processes are deeply hampered by uh, extended mm -hmm. possibilities of citizen participation. Mm -hmm which have been introduced by pressure of the Greens. And by the way, right, this has been, because uh, citizens need to participate in policy making. But now the government says, well, we need to speed up our process of building up windmills and whatever else, and therefore we need to speed up our administrative procedures, which runs, runs exactly counter to the original ideas mm -hmm. to have more citizen participation. So you see there are some contradictions. And as far as my perspective is concerned, I really think that migration policies and energy policies are the core issues because here I feel that the government is, well, not in line with how reality really works. Mm -hmm. Here there will be some kind of a crash down uh, on the hard rocketed ground of, of reality. And here there will be need for uh, quite steep learning curves on part of the government. But if the new government should really adjust to how reality is like in terms of migration and of energy supply, then, then this government could be quite helpful for, for Germany. Mm -hmm. Just like Chancellor Schröder, when he initiated the Agenda 2010 reforms, which ran counter to the soul of the Social Democratic Party, mm -hmm. uh, but were very useful, helpful, uh, beneficial for the German economy. 
And this is one of my hopes for the new coalition, but it's only a hope. A hope. It's not a prediction. And wait two years, then we come back and we'll discuss what the government has made out of this chance. Hope never dies. But um, to come back now to the question of migration, uh, gender questions, Prime Minister Viktor Orban, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, just wrote an article in the German, uh, biggest German newspaper, the Bild Zeitung, on Wednesday, on the day of the inauguration of the German government, and he wrote clearly that many things divide us now with Germany, migration, gender, the debt union, and more competences to Brussels. What do you think about these disagreements, Professor Patzelt? Actually, I think that Viktor Orban is absolutely right in his observation. And I think that the Hungarian concerns about the direction of German uh, policymaking are well taken as well. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, to migration, uh, the, the German approach will not work in the future. See, in the coalition uh, agreement, you see that Germany wants to remain open. It wants to liberalize migration. It wants to make <coughs> illegal immigration legal and mm -hmm. so on. At the same time, the government hopes that the European Union will come, however, to a common approach to migration policies. But Germany will be left alone with her approach, so this does not work. When it comes to, uh, to, to, to gender, well, this goes to the core of the green soul, so to speak, mm -hmm. and to the leftist soul in Germany. Something like naturalistic thinking. Mm -hmm. There is something in nature which you should respect when establishing political or cultural social institutions, this is a no-go in Germany. Because having a naturalistic approach, you're quite close to racism, mm -hmm. to genderism and so on. This is not feasible. Mm -hmm. And this is a significant distinction between, so to speak, the naive, in quotation mark, approach of Hungarians who say, well, there are males and females, and the family consists of a father, a mother, and children. This goes counter to the, well, inner convictions of progressive academic mm -hmm. Germans. And what were, were the other two points? Je uh, debt union and more competences to Brussels. Yeah, debt union, well, Germany is benefiting so much from the Eurozone, a Euro the Eurozone, is a problem for countries with uh, less economic power and uh, not so strong, in earlier times, not so strong state budgets as Germany is. Therefore, if you want to go on to benefit from the union and if you do not want uh, to lose all the money we have uh, used to guarantee state debt around the European Union, then we have to maintain this union. Therefore, we need to share the burdens, the burdens, uh, the burdens of public debt. And if we have promised in earlier years that there won't be some kind of socialization of state debt, in the framework of the European Union. Well, wrong we have been, we are free to learn, and, and now this is the way to go. And as far as the European Union and the creation of United States of Europe is concerned, I think people have to better understand, in, partic in particular in Hungary, in Poland, and in so on, that the German approach to the European Union is quite different from the approach of Italian, Spanish, French, UK, and so on. The German feeling is, the area of the nation states is over. And we Germans are the best example. See where the nation state has driven Europe into wars caused by Germany because Germany wanted to have a nation state, a big, important nation state. Let's get rid of nationalism. Let's get rid of the nation state. Let's bring all the nation states under the umbrella of the European Union and then we will have peace. We will have a wonderful situation. And if these Hungarians would not insist so much on the nation state, tiny as they are, things in Europe would be much, much better than they are right now. Follow our German example. This is one of mm. the common approaches. And it's not only this, so to speak, well, lack of confidence in one's own nation, which leads Germany to this kind of European policy. It is historical experience. See, Germany, for the most part of its history, has lived in the structure of the Holy Roman Empire, mm. having an umbrella structure mm -hmm. above the single territories, duchies, principalities, and so on. So it's no problem to live in a multi-governing system. The, the emperor has had some useful functions. It was a space 
hopefully on paper, not in reality, of peace. And so the European Union is, is something like a modernized republican form of the old Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. which was, so to speak, a homeland for many different cultures. And why don't these Polish and Hungarians not understand this. And French and Spanish and Italian. And all the rest of Europe. You know the movie Kevin Alone at Home? Uh, Germany seems to be Kevin Alone at Home. Uh, Prime Minister Orban also wrote in this article that Angela Merkel started a post-Christian, a post-national politics. But for us Hungarians, the national cultural identity is of utmost importance. And I remember Professor Röder was here in, in July and he stated that, are you surprised that you are criticized by uh, many people in Europe because you are actually the counter model of the leftist identity politics? So uh, what is your opinion on that? Is, is it really like this, that in Germany is it totally a post-Christian world, a post-national politics? Is it not reversible anymore? Well, post-national, yes, this is the case. This is not true for all Germans, you know, there is always some kind of a frequency distribution. Yeah. But in particular, in particular, academics, intellectuals, mm -hmm. left-leaning mostly, they really feel that the era of the nation state is over and should be over. So uh, the wonderful role model of Germany is the model of a post-national nation, of a post-national state, of something which embraces everybody who wants to cultivate the rule of law and democracy. Mm -hmm. All these people should come to the center of Europe and spread to Hungary, Spain, and so on, because then the spirit of chauvinism, of racism, would disappear. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, so the point is well taken. Germany, not all, for instance, not myself, are longing for a post-national state. Uh, as to post Christianity, things are different. Things are different. Um, in East Germany, one of the everlasting effects of socialist rule has been the vaporization, to put it this way, of Christianity. When the communists came to power, there were some, something like 80%, 80, 85, 90% of the population of GDR, members of at least one of the uh, Christian confessions. Uh, now their percentage has shrunk down to something like uh, 30, 30, 40 percent, percent for the uh, Protestants and something like 5 percent for, for Catholics. So the whole culture is de-Christianized. And the same is true for many parts of West Germany. Mm -hmm. The facade of Christianity still is there. Mm -hmm. uh, the churches are there, renovated, in wonderful shape, beautiful, but empty. Mm -hmm. And the souls are empty. And this is well taken, but maybe this is the cause of secularization in Europe. But we have to confess that countries like Czech, the Czech Republic, Germany, uh, some of the Baltic states Estonia. are really on top mm -hmm. and others are lagging behind, like Hungary, once more. Once more. <laughs> now, if the Germans gave up all this uh, national state thinking, thinking in the concept, overall concept of the post-national European Union, the coalition Green would actually roll down. They believe in a federal Europe. How this would work? How can Germany, or how Germany wants to impose its will on all other sovereign national states in Europe? That's the question. If I was a British, I would say, well, here you see that the Germans are still dreaming of a Fourth Reich. They use the European Union as, well, a new form of Imperial Germany, with the Germans controlling mm. the EU machinery, not overtly, but in the way of Brexit driving. Mm -hmm. All important jobs are filled by Germans and disguised as European multilateralism. In fact, they want to make clear that European policy should be along German lines. Mm -hmm. As far as economic policy is concerned, fiscal policy is concerned, this has been true mm -hmm. until the time when the, Brit when the United Kingdom left the European Union. Now Germany is without a majority uh, in her economic approach. As to the political approach, I have to remind you of the things I've told before. It is really the German vision that nation states should disappear mm -hmm. and that in some kind of United States of Europe, everybody should live in peace and somehow mixed up 
with every other nation as well, and this was, would lead us into a bright future. Actually, I do not think that this will work well. This is some of the German illusions. There is a famous say, saying of uh, the German poet Heinrich Heine back in the 19th century. Uh, the British rule the seas, the Russians rule the land, but the lofty sky, the heaven of political illusions, this is dominated by the Germans. Mm. And uh, this is still a nice characterization of the German approach to European poli policies. And it will not help to pay lip service uh, to other nations saying, well, we want to be together, we want to have an ever closer union when most other European countries, neither the big ones like France nor the smaller ones like Hungary, really share this vision. Mm -hmm. Again, Kevin alone at home. Germany is alone with this vision of Europe, and therefore I feel, I predict even, that this approach will fail. You elaborated a little bit about the migration policies of the new German government, and taking into consideration their policies towards the European Union, Kevin alone in home, Will we have again these big disputes on the migration questions that we had in 2015 with a very clear division? Germany and then uh, Central Eastern Europe, and I see a little bit of shift towards, uh, towards the opinions of Central Eastern European countries. I think the position of Hungary is now shared by more countries than in 2015. Will there be a clash again? We will have some disputes, some discussions, mm -hmm. but uh, everybody can see that the Polish efforts at protecting their own eastern borderline are not as heavily criticized as the Hungarian attempts have been uh, in uh, 2015 and uh, so the following year. Uh, you can feel, if not <coughs> even read and hear, that many who participate in Germany in these discussions are really relieved by the fact mm -hmm. that the Polish are behaving as they behave because they know that if we open a channel for new migration, attracted by the German social system magnetism, well, then the populist, the right-wing populist wave all throughout Europe will be strengthened. The German population will no longer accept migration in that way of, well, overheated welcoming culture that we have had in 2015, that in Germany the AFD will get more and more votes in spite of their weaknesses, mm -hmm. which they display in many, many respects. And therefore, uh, without really internally or psychologically agreeing with this decision, Germans say, well, we need a common policy. This common policy cannot be the German role model of 2015. It is the Polish and the previous Hungarian role model. Therefore, as a Hungarian, I would lean back, would say, well, the learning processes in Germany may be a, bit, a, little, sl a little slow, mm -hmm. but they are now going on. Not without public discussions, because who really wants to say, hey, I was wrong yesterday, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other points that Prime Minister Orban identified is the gender policy, and we should elaborate more on that. It can be the gender policy also a part of a tool to, to show other Europeans the German will, because in the coalition agreement it's clearly said that they will, uh, for, they will actually work on all other countries accepting the new German model of the family, meaning that any kind of patchwork and every situation, families, let's call it like that, would have to be accepted by all other European countries. How do you see this? Well, you can have dreams. <laughs> you can have illusions of being omnipotent. My feeling is that this exaggerations will not be shared by other countries. I mean, the core conviction is a proper one. If males want to marry males and females want to marry females and they want to have the protection of the law for binding themselves together for the rest of their life, taking care of each other, why should the state not allow this to be the case? Whether you call it family or not, well, this, this depends on, on how you want to feel about these things. But if we go further, saying, well, there doesn't exist something like females and males, mm -hmm. we have to make uh, clear that anything goes. Mm -hmm. I feel today as a woman, so I should be entitled to, well, have the role of a woman, and the day after tomorrow is a different way. These are the exaggerations. 
And, and here, the, the German political rhetoric and the attempts at finding uh, adequate legal regulations will end in an impasse. Because, see, you can use gender talk. What about the transsexuals? You can make, in the German language, uh, so to speak, uh, s small pauses mm -hmm. uh, between the word and the feminine suffix which is attached to it. But this is awkward. This mm -hmm. is not beautiful. This is disgusted by, by many Germans. So exaggerating even sound ideas and in an impasse, and I think that uh, although there are some sound ideas in this approach to gender politics, these exaggerations mm -hmm. end in an impasse, and all German attempts to impose this, I nearly had said nonsense, mm -hmm. to impose this nonsense to other countries will not work. I would like to come to another topic, fiscal and economic policies, and the question of the debts and uh, having more debts. As we know that the civic uh, liberal FDP uh, tried to avoid tax raises. They managed to do that. They also tried to avoid the speed limit on highways. They managed to do that. But now the question is what price they paid for. And would you have anticipated, would you have believed that the market-oriented civic liberal party would actually advocate for more debts via their finance minister just two days after his inauguration? Well, I think that this is one of these tricks politicians used to apply when they are in a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. This government plans to spend a lot of money for this and that and that, and actually uh, there is no fiscal or economic or state budget base for many of the policy projects which are in the coalition agreement. Therefore, since there has been the promise not to raise taxes, they simply use uh, money which was reserved for uh, reconstruction measures after the pandemic mm -hmm. for other purposes. This is <laughs> attaching a different label. Uh, actually, this money should not be used if there is no need for this money. And if there is need for this money for recovery out of the uh, consequences of the, of the pandemic, it should not be used for other infrastructural uh, endeavors. So this is the way in which the FDP tries to get out of the impasse into which this party had to move because mm -hmm. this party wanted to be part of this government, a government which wants to spend so much money for their own visions. And uh, I would like to go to the question of the energy supply problems Germany has at the moment. Uh, now, the new government wants to increase the renewables uh, to 80% as of the year of 2030. Coal should be abolished by the date, and 15 million energy-driven cars should drive on the German streets. But we know that at the end of next year, all the last three nuclear atomic plants will be switched off. Still a decision by the Merkel government. How realistic is this goal to achieve this energy mix like that? And will there be an energy shortcut in Germany? What do you see? Think back to the famous saying by Heine, which I've quoted before. Mm -hmm. Germans are the champions <laughs> when it comes to the heaven of illusions and ideas and these energy uh, policies is really a part of that. Mm -hmm. It is at the core of green identity so that the Greens became an important party in Germany because they were anti-nuclear energy and anti-other things. So now they can turn their promises into practice. They can't be the first ones to stop nuclear energy because it was Angela Merkel pursuing green policies who made this decision a couple of years ago. But now they will feel that they are in a trap. And the mm -hmm. trap is a strategic one. Everybody knows getting rid of nuclear energy at the same time as getting rid of uh, energy from coal mm -hmm. will produce an energy gap. And this gap will be uh, the bigger the more you want to move towards more digitalization, which requires more energy, if you want to have a hydrogen economy, which we want to have, which requires a lot of electric energy, if you want to have e-mobility, what we want to have for recharging all these uh, uh, e-driven uh, automobiles, you need a lot of energy. So what are we doing? And the government itself confesses this fact. We need to fill this gap with Russian gas. So, due to our illusionary energy supply policies, we bring our country in dependency from Russia, 
-hmm. And by paying for these gas exports or imports, we give the Russians some money for more armament and for military threats at the eastern flank of NATO, what we are seeing right now. This is a non-cohesive policy, full of contradictions. But see, sometimes in an impasse, you find exit strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one exit strategy, it's not a prediction, it's a hope, but some of my hopes have come true in the past, <laughs> it's the following one. The French never wanted to get rid of, of nuclear energy, never. Yes. There's a percentage of nuclear energy, I guess it's something like 70% or so on. And now the French uh, president has advocated for a new generation of uh, atomic power plants, smaller, and, and, and so on. And they really want Germany to join that. Mm -hmm. They really want to create a coherent European energy supply system. Mm -hmm. So we Germans, good Europeans as we are, not thinking about national interests and so on. Nations are not important. European central regulations are important. And the French are our best friends in Europe apart from the Hungarians, of course, under normal course. circumstances. Back to serious argument, and since the French advocate for that, mm -hmm. well, we have to rank our interests. And the interest in maintaining good relationships of showing that we really and truly and full in our heart are Europeans, well, we delay our exit from nuclear energy. See, mm -hmm. this might be a politically wise exit from the dilemma in which you are, because nobody will believe that we can increase uh, the percentage of uh, renewable energy supply in this speed, given, as I mentioned before, all these uh, obstacles by administrative, by planning, by participation uh, procedures that we have when it comes to building up infrastructure in Germany. It would be actually not the first time that the Green Party is uh, making a U-turn in such policies. I remember 20 years ago when there was the Afghanistan question on the table, the Green Party, coming from the pacifist movement, very sharply turned 180 degree when the interests have been dictating that. But coming to the economies, economy and the German companies, how do the companies in Germany manage this left turn? Uh, not to talk about the minimum wage that is now introduced or actually increased in a very radical manner, but also other restrictions, for example, the compulsory solar panels on newly built industrial buildings and such on. How will the German companies react to that? Will they all come to Hungary? Well, maybe some enterprises will think about coming to Hungary because those who are present in this country, active in the country, have made, as far as I hear, good experiences. But back to the core of the argument. What German enterprises really want is stable framework conditions mm -hmm. for the planning. Uh, engineers and uh, the budget people in the enterprises can adapt with many circumstances. They can find solutions, but they need stable circumstances, a stable framework. And this is the hope of the, of the, of the German big economics, that now, with this cool set, they can rely. There is an end to... Uh, uh, to, 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 to traditional engines mm -hmm. for motor cars, there is an end to that, and uh, we will move into this direction so we can make investments and then we can cope with things. The things are different uh, for middle-scale uh, eco economic enterprises like they are in, in East Germany, uh, having not so, so much capital depending on, uh, on market, not being in uh, tariff systems with regulated wages for these the minimum wage will be a problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, the minimum wage will attract more immigration to Germany because uh, the new German minimum wage for persons coming, fra say, from Somalia or uh, from Afghanistan is highly attractive. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is one of the solutions of a really existing problem we have. Mm -hmm. We have too few people who really want to do manual work to do the simple jobs, which usually are not as wonderful as intellectual jobs. And maybe this minimal wage may be helpful for attracting them and for integrating them into the German labor market mm -hmm. and not only into the German social security system. But this is an experiment, and we need to wait and see and to analyze. Ladies and gentlemen, I have only a few questions left. 
So you should think already about your questions that you would like to ask Professor Patzel. But I would like to turn a little bit to the Hungarian-German German -Hungarian relations. How will be the policy that we now actually described and we analyze in a little bit of the new German government affect the relations to Hungary, the effect the relations to Central Eastern European countries? Well, since the approaches to, uh, to European politics, the future of the European Union, are so different, and since the reflections about the value of the own nation, the nation state, are so different. I would not say that we should be too hopeful for an improvement in German-Hungarian mm -hmm. relationships. Much will depend on the outcome of the coming Hungarian elections. Much will depend on the situation in Hungary after the elections, whatever their result will be. And much will depend on the priorities of German foreign policy. Under Chancellor Kohl, it was quite clear that a central interest of Germany is to be in good relationships with the Eastern, East Central European countries, to be, as a big nation, a friend, a true friend of the smaller nations, not patronizing them, not saying, well, we are better than you, our role model should be followed by you. If the German government would accept that the best it can do for Europe is to keep Europe integrated mm -hmm. by respecting smaller countries which are more in favor of preserving the national identity, then relationships could improve. For the time being, I would not have too much hope, but uh, the new government will have to accept learning curves in many dimensions. On the Hungarian side, I would say that an attitude of patience, of mm -hmm. perseverance, of smoothly moving on, if one believes to be on the correct way, of not saying things which might offend other politicians mm -hmm. who see things differently, might be the wisest approach uh, to go through this period, difficult period of German-Hungarian relationships. I think Germany, Germany will learn how to behave on the level of the responsibility attached to Germany in United Europe. And after having driven out the UK from the European Union due to wrong foreign policy behavior of, on part of Germany, they should be cautious not to commit the same mistakes, cultural mistakes, stylistic mistakes in dealing with Poland, Hungary, and some other countries. Now, we talked a lot about uh, what was written on the paper, so the theory, but now let's come a little bit to the practice. I know the government was only five days old, so uh, not a long time to, to, drive, uh, to derive big conclusions, but we could see already some uh, very important visits to uh, Brussels, to Paris, to Warsaw, by the Chancellor Scholz and by Foreign Minister Baerbock. Uh, can you comment on uh, these visits a little bit? How can we see the amelioration of relations and what concrete questions uh, now on the, on the table. Actually, out of this itinerary, you can't draw too many conclusions mm -hmm. because it's the standard itinerary of German chancellors and of German foreign, uh, foreign ministers. You have to go to Paris because this <coughs> is our closest ally for, for good reason. You have to go to Brussels. You have to go to Poland. Uh, so this is the way it ought to be. This is the usual way to establish personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And for Annalena Baerbock, it will, be, it will have been the beginning of a long journey along which she will find out how foreign policy really works. And that in most countries, not values are the top issue, but interests are the top issue. And that you can't represent Germany in a trustworthy way if you say, no, we don't have any interests, we only have <laughs> values, and hey, they're the same values, so why do we disagree? No, it's the beginning of a learning process, and I think so far, these new government members have made the best possible figure they could, made, they could make under these circumstances. Let's hope this goes on in this way. We will see. Uh, but today, uh, we cannot avoid this question, it's a very French day, at least in Hungary. French President Emmanuel Macron is uh, today in Budapest. He paid visit um, 
to the summit of the Visegrad Four leaders. Since 2007, there was no French president in Hungary. Macron said about uh, Prime Minister Orban, I quote, he's a political opponent of the European partner, end of the quotation. What does this mean for us? Is this an orientation towards the very pragmatic French president? It is a good role model because it is at the core of pluralistic democracy and at the core of peaceful relationships between nations. If you accept, you have different goals, different viewpoints, but you try to do the best in terms of cooperation. So it is good that the French president finally found his way to Hungary <laughs> and to the Visegrad countries, and uh, it is a sign of good handling of foreign affairs, not to put the accent on ideological questions, but on things that one has in common in terms of common interests. And if France in this way should show Germans how to really integrate the European Union mm -hmm. by trying to build up good and, re and reliable uh, relationships, then the German-French mutual jealousy mm -hmm. would even have a positive effect on German foreign policy behavior because basically some historically minded Germans think back of the post World War I phase when France tried to cooperate with the East European mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. in order to encircle uh, Germany, mm -hmm. which seemed to be uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. We never, we Germans never want to experience such things again. So we should be careful. We should not destroy our good relationships with our Central European neighbors, finding that France builds up special relationships with them mm -hmm. uh, to the, well, not to the advantage of Germany. Mm -hmm. So I think it's wonderful that the French president has done so, but we should try to be on the same level of friendship and cultivation of good relations. But remember the discussions and the decisions about the president of the European Commission where the French president and Hungarian prime minister had a cooperation and in the end they managed uh, to push through a candidate they really wanted. So maybe this could be a start of a very good, nice love. But I'm coming now to Germany a little bit and have three more questions and then the auditorium has the floor to ask questions or to comment on. The three more questions that relate a little bit to the inner structure of Germany. First of all, the inner cohesion of this coalition. How stable, long-lasting can be this coalition, this new German coalition, taking into account that I don't know whether they have a majority in the Bundesrat, in the second chamber. So far I see not really. My best educated guess when it comes to the question how long will this coalition last is either it will last two years or two legislative terms. Mm -hmm. See, there are so many problems within this coalition, conflicts between the program of this coalition and reality, differences in political accents and interests of the three parties of this coalition, that if these differences and conflicts are managed nicely during the first two years. And if the government survives uh, the withdrawal of sympathy by the mass media, which certainly will happen mm -hmm. uh, in the course of February latest, then after having had their curve of learning, they can go on for uh, two legislative terms since the Christian Democratic is out of orientation. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if you need another government, you need a plausible alternative provided by the CDU. But so far, it's not it's no solid, no concise policy program of the CDU is in sight. So as long as the CDU is in such a weak position, the government only needs to manage the internal conflicts, and it will stay in power. As far as the Federal Council is concerned, the important issue is not whether you have a majority. The important issue is whether you have a majority against you. Mm -hmm. And this is due to the rules of voting in the, in the Federal Council. There are no abstentions which are counted as abstentions. There are only votes for something. So you need to have enough lender who vote for your positions. 
Now, on lender level, we have different coalitions. And usually, there is in the lender coalition contracts a clause saying, if we, our governing coalition in Bavaria, Saxony, whatever country, do not agree on any policy stance we are going to take in the Bundesrat, we abstain. Mm -hmm. And this means we say no. Mm -hmm. We say no. So it will become quite difficult uh, to organize the non-existence of negative, that is, abstaining majorities mm -hmm. in the Bundesrat. And this whole uh, political game of giving and taking will continue even in more condensed and more complicated form than we have seen it in the past. Just for the Hungarian audience, uh, maybe you might know that actually in, there are 16 uh, countries in Germany, 16 Länder, and in all the 60, you know, we have different coalitions in different uh, setups. So there is actually a rainbow coalition all over Germany, if you could say so. And if I count it correct, only in Rheinland-Pfalz and in Hamburg, they are exclusively these parties governing that are actually governing the federal level. So the coalition has no own uh, majority, but as Professor Patzel pointed out uh, very wisely, it depends on the circumstances and how there would be no other majority formed against the government. Now, you partly un answered my question, but I would like to come back a little bit as we elaborated about the FDP, the Social Democrats, much about the Greens, but we didn't elaborate too much about the Christian Democratic Union. Most people don't know, but since Saturday last week, there is a vote in the, among the party membership. And uh, there are again three candidates and again a, a Congress in the CDU coming up. Uh, what is with the CDU? What is the shape of the CDU? How the CDU will move on? Has the CDU grown up to its new situation, to its new role in the opposition? And the guess, who will be the party president? Well, what about the shape of the CDU? This party is in a very, very bad shape. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is that twice the party establishment prevented the candidate of the hearts of the party members mm -hmm. being elected. When Angela Merkel stopped being chair of the party, she made sure that not her long year rival Friedrich Merz became her successor, mm -hmm. but twice she made sure, with the help of the party establishment, that two persons became chairpersons of the Christian Democratic Union, who, at least in the eyes of the public, promised to move on along Angela Merkel's policy lines. And both of them failed. Annegret kram karrenbauer after a short while, as the chair of the party, and Armin Laschet, a real tragedy, a real tragedy, a man who has ru ruined his own political career by the vain attempt not only to become party chair, but chancellor candidate and chancellor. So this time, for the first time, Ever since the rule of Angela Merkel, the base of the party, the membership, will have a say in who will become the new party chairperson. And here it is quite clear. Most of the party members prefer Friedrich Merz. Mm -hmm. Whether they do it for good reasons or bad reasons mm -hmm. needs to be seen. So far, in my impression, uh, Friedrich Merz is something like a projection screen. Mm -hmm. All people project their hopes for a new cause of the party onto Friedrich Merz. For the ones, he's a conservative. For the others, he is an expert in uh, financial and economic uh, affairs. For the others, he's the one who will modify or revise or correct the wrong political course of Angela Merkel. For the others, he's somebody trying to take personal revenge on Angela Merkel and mm -hmm. her policies. Uh, who has driven him out from policies to become a billionaire, by the way, uh, some 20 years ago. So the open question is, will Friedrich Merz be able to open up a discussion in the Christian Democratic mm -hmm. Union on what this party should stand for? Mm -hmm. What are the goals of this party? What are the contents of the party? See, for many years there was no substantial discussion in the ranks of the CDU. The only discussion was, are you a supporter of Angela Merkel or are you not? Are you a supporter of humanitarian German migration policies mm -hmm. or are you a nationalist hiddenly being a friend of the AFD? Mm. Mm? There was no 
discussion on policy substance. There were empty words like conservatism. The Christian Democratic Union needs to be more conservative. But hell, what does it mean? Nobody in the Christian Democratic Union will tell you. Sometimes they tell you stories, well, they're in favor of conservative values. If you ask them what a conservative value would be, you quite often get as an answer descriptions of values, which in the last century were liberal values, social democratic values, to which the conservatives were strictly opposed. Mm -hmm. So th there is a lack of, so to speak, intellectual work in this party. Mm -hmm. and I do not yet see whether this party will be willing to do the necessary intellectual work to fight back intellectual hegemony, or at least to be not helpless mm -hmm. with those who now are in the position of having uh, intellectual and, and, and cultural control over the German political discourse, and what the way will be the party will take. I'm quite sure that Friedrich Merz will be the next party chair, but for the rest, I'm absolutely without any predictions. What do you think, uh, him being elected already in January, being the chancellor candidate, would the CDU have managed to keep the position of the chancellor? And everything would look very nice today, or are you having doubts about that? I have, I have doubts about that. Mm -hmm. See, uh, after 16 years of the CDU in power, it mm -hmm. is a legitimate objective to have a change in power. And uh, I could not see how Merz, if he had been elected in mm -hmm. earlier times, could have won over the fans of Angela Merkel and her yeah. policies in the Christian Democratic Union. The whole uh, leadership core of the party mm -hmm. uh, made their careers under the umbrella, under the protection, along yeah. the policy lines of Angela Merkel. No, without this failure, without this tremendous defeat at the elections, there would have been no chance whatsoever mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, to uh, bring the CDU to think about whether her own policy shortcomings might be among the causes of mm. the failure, because now nearly nobody will claim anymore that it was only the wrong candidate for the chancellorship mm. who caused this defeat. It is the intellectual and substantial emptiness of this party. Now, I may ask, uh, um, or if it's allowed, I would bring a little advertisement here in. Uh, we have published a new book of Friedrich Merz, New Times, New Responsibilities in Hungarian language. And uh, this book is available from this week in the shops. So feel free to buy it. But now we reached actually uh, 10 minutes past six. And in my program, I, uh, I'm reading here that the audience can have questions. So it's now your turn uh, to ask questions, to comment on or uh, to ask something that you always wanted to know about the German politics, but you never dared to ask. Here's the, here's the possibility. Uh, Professor Patzelt is a big expert about all these questions. The floor is yours. We have a micro going around. So is it, there is a micro. Who will make the icebreaker question? Please, yes, one question, two questions. Please, ladies first. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Um, it, does Cardinal Mueller have any influence in the country? And if so, what is it? I didn't get the name. Who Cardinal Mueller? Cardinal Mueller. Ah, Cardinal Mueller. Oh, you're thinking of Rome. As far as I see, among uh, traditional Catholics, he has significant influence, in particular due to the fact that uh, Pope Francis kicked him out of office. Uh, but beyond these circles, I do not see much influence that he might play. And this is why I was not aware that you were talking about Cardinal Müller. This never came to my mind. Thank you. There is a second question over there in the, in the, in the back. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, Peter Müller, my name. I have a, you are very optimistic for Friedrich Merz to win the, uh, to be the head of the CDU. But do you, have, do you think he has a chance to fight an uphill battle against the uh, television? Hmm. It's a public sector television in Germany and 80% of the press who, uh, who de demonize him as a man of the past. Hmm. I mean, it would be really is an uh, uphill battle to win a, another election for the CDU with him. Hmm. Well, this is an uphill battle, no doubt about that. 
but compare him with his two rivals, <laughs> former Minister Braun, uh, helper of Angela Merkel, would not win that by no means. And Norbert Röttgen, I do not think either. If somebody has a chance to stand this battle, then it will be Friedrich Merz because he is very eloquent. He knows the things about which he is talking. There is no chance to say, well, you only want to become a politician to make a lot of money without working for it, because Friedrich Merz is somebody who does not need political income uh, because he's rich enough. Well, he has been, before Angela Merkel turned up, somebody with whom German media have been sympathizing mm -hmm. 20 years ago, 20 years ago. They have been so fixed to Angela Merkel that they dislike everybody criticizing Angela Merkel, like Friedrich Merz. But somebody has to lead this uphill battle. Mm -hmm. And you can be sure that many journalists, males and females likewise, after having talked and written and moderated Habeck and Baerbock to power, will become more critical about the government and the performance of the government. And so this appeal situation might be in the future no longer such a steep one like right now. And if anyone can for the foreseeable future, it's exactly the challenge for Friedrich Merz to stand these problems going along with journalists who do not like the Christian Democratic Union. So maybe there might be better persons, but so far they have not appeared in the ranks of the CDU. Dear audience, you can of course ask your questions also in German or in Hungarian language. So you don't need to ask in English. You can of course use German and Hungarian. Tünde. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the for the discussion. Uh, I'm very interested in your statement that Annalena Baerbock has to find out how foreign policy works in her own. And I would like to ask, do you think that um, Germany and the German foreign relations could have negative impacts because of uh, Frau Baerbock's um, policies or way of uh, doing policy? Or what do you really mean by this statement that she has to find out. So she, do you think that she's not, able, she's not the, the best choice for this uh, ministry? What's your opinion? Well, maybe she has been the best possible choice because it was her choice herself. She claimed that she is experienced in international law and therefore the role of foreign policy minister should be hers. And usually in Germany during some decades, the boss of the minor coalition partner was foreign minister. Maybe Habeck wanted to have this job instead of the much more important job of being minister of finance and uh, climate management, as they call it. Now, she has this job. Uh, she is apparently uh, a person with a lot of ambition, and she's prepared to learn a lot of things. Uh, the challenge is not to become the object of, well, ridiculization <laughs> from others. But if she avoids that and tries to behave as a foreign policy minister should behave, without being too talky, without uh, being, well, too sharp in remarks, well, then the truth will appear. The truth is German foreign policy is made by the German chancellor. The foreign policy, the foreign minister is something like a loudspeaker <laughs> of the policies defined by the chancellor. There are some exceptions, like foreign, policy, uh, foreign minister Willy Brandt, back in the, in the 60s, who had had tremendous own political weight and inspiration, a foreign policy minister Genscher, who was experienced. But this is different. Uh, Annalena Baerbock has not significant experience or political weight. Uh, her consolation might be that her predecessor as German foreign policy minister, Heiko Maas, 
was a lightweight either, so she will be able to compete with him anyway. Uh, I would say there is no need to be concerned about continuity in German foreign policy. These exaggerations and illusions vis-a-vis -vis the United States of Europe and so on, mm -hmm. they will well, they will crash when they come in contact with reality, and this has already, already begun. Let the Soviet Union send some troops into Ukraine. The whole world looks different, and the whole illusions uh, of uh, green foreign policy will disappear, like they disappeared 20 years ago when it came to Afghanistan and, and to the, the war on the Balkans and so on. No, there is no need to be too concerned. She will try to do her very best. Uh, and uh, so far, after the first experiences with her in this new role, well, she seems to be able to make a good figure. Somebody else with more questions? You can ask your questions in English, German, or Hungarian. Please. Um, Zoltan uh, Suyo, a question to um, uh, United uh, States of Europe, what you mentioned. We know that um, prime ministers are bargaining two or three days in Brussels for a 1% uh, EU budget every year or every four years, two or three days uh, for this 1%. What do you think uh, this one person would be enough for the uh, for, uh, United States of uh, Europe it is, um, uh, that is much more needed? Let's say 10% or 15, 15% at least. What do you think about this? Well, the whole political system of the European Union, to answer in more general and not personalized terms, the whole political system of, of the European Union is a system in being, is a system uh, with which we do some experimentation, and it is not as it ought to be if you want really to have coherent uh, European policy making. It is nonsensical to have a commissioner from each member state because uh, there is no guarantee that you find the adequate persons. Uh, it is a problem to make the European Commission dependent on the European Parliament if the European Parliament uh, is not based on the, on the democratic principle of one person, one vote, because the European Parliament itself is distorted in every possible respect. Uh, it is illusionary to uh, simulate parliamentary democracy or democracy at all if there is no common language of the European peoples. Uh, it is not possible to build up United States of Europe if the people do not feel as being a people of Europe. Mm -hmm. They feel as Hungarians, Greek, French, apart from the Germans who always are cosmopolitans <laughs> and, and Europeans, that they feel as members of the nation states. And the European political system is not matching this situation of the European countries. And therefore, all individual positions, who gets what, uh, what job and so on, well, they are done in a framework which is not suited for real problem solving. And therefore, we need to put it bluntly and with some uh, sar sarcasm, we need to run into more institutional crisis, huh. such that the knowledge spreads that we need a reform of the European political system, not designed to be the system of United States of Europe, but designed as a system of a union of states which want to maintain a zone of common prosperity, of common security, or, or in this zone, as the French put it, uh, une Europe à géométrie variable, with a variable geometry where some nations want to cooperate more closely on, their, on those affairs, others on others. So I think whenever we think about individual persons or personal decisions and so on, we should never forget that all these problems have the origin in the fact that the European political system is not as it should be if we want really to govern our European community. Thank you very much. The next question. I think what you have mentioned, Rainer Kaschel is my name, I think what you have mentioned now is very interesting. I also see it like you that there has to be a restructuring of the European Union because the actual 
uh, European does not work. We mm -hmm. see it also in the competitiveness when we compare the competitiveness of the European Union with the US or with China. Mm -hmm. We always lose competitiveness. Uh, so, what would you say? How likely is it that there could be some reforms of the European Union? And what would be your prognosis? What should happen in which, which way? Because I see it very unlikely that there could happen some reforms on European Union, although they should happen. Uh, so, that is really for me also a very important topic to understand what could be, what is the scenario you would like to see, or what would you think what could be the next steps? I do not want to talk about the scenario that I would like, because the scenario in which alone significant reforms of the Euro European political system would be made, be made is a phase, an experience of deep institutional crisis. This I do not like, but this is the only occasion. This is what might be called in theory of history a critical juncture. Europe needs to get into a situation of a critical juncture when things that have been taken for granted so far well, are no longer believable or trustworthy that you, such that you think of new ideas. I do not yet know which crisis will lead uh, the European political class into this situation. And then even this critical juncture would be, would be arrived at by the European political class. Then there comes the important question. What is our vision of Europe? What is, so to speak, the finality of the European Union? So far, so many take it as granted, as the natural thing to do, that the European nations should grow more and more together, that more and more policy areas should be handled by Brussels. Uh, in Germany, this is called the bicycle theory of European integration, mm -hmm. meaning a bicycle will be only stable as long as it is moving forward. A European integration is a process which needs to go on and to go on and to go on, otherwise it will end in a failure. And as long as this bicycle theory is in the minds of, of, of the people, <coughs> we need to grow together, it won't work. At the next critical juncture, we will need to accept, and be it against our desires and our hopes and our emotions, we need to accept that we can hold together the European nations only if we give them more leeway, more maneuvering space, more place for cultivating own identities. Only nations that do not feel to be not only controlled, but guided, led by the Brussels institutions, only such nations will be able and willing to agree on policy areas in which they want to cooperate really closely. Think of the defense issues, mm -hmm. for instance. How should it be possible that a European Department of Defense with European uh, joint chiefs of staff would be in command of a European army? When in Germany it is constitutional law that each move of the German army needs to be voted for by the Bundestag. So this is only an example from the German perspective. Most Germans will say, no, this is not possible. Here we have to defend our rule of law, whatever else. So only if we give more individuality to the paths democratically based national governments see for themselves within the framework of the European Union, then we can intensify, intensify our cooperation on those policy fields which is necessary. But this is quite a different thinking about Europe than we used to think before. We want a new treaty, establishing new institutions, shifting more competences to the European level, parliamentarize the European Commission. At the end of the day, we see there are nations with their own interests, and these nations will rather quit the European Union but submit themselves to a Brussels-based government. But this is a mindset which is not shared in Germany. Mm -hmm. And without uh, German consenting to reforms, there won't be any reforms. So this is the best message I can send to you. And I, do not, I really do not look forward to a crisis of the European Union in which we would have the chances of a critical juncture. But this crisis will come, no doubt. 
Maybe there is a possibility for a last question. I'm asking the auditorium. Is there some last question? Please, gentlemen. Good evening, Piotr Kotsuba. Um, I have just a very simple question, maybe to both of you. Um, we were talking very much about the new German government, and I'm very much interested in the German-Hungarian relations, but I have a different angle of viewing this, and my question would be, do you think there is anything the Hungarian government could do to um, allow to improve the German-Hungarian relations? Because until now we were just talking about the Germans, mm -hmm. the fault of the Germans, and what the Germans could do or you know, improve. But is there anything the Hungarian government could you know, also put in? Well, you know, my problem is that I do not speak, not understand Hungarian. So I can only rely on things that I hear from others. And what I hear from others is that some statements of the Hungarian government directed to Germany, to the European uh, policymakers, are too strongly self-assertive, sometimes offensive, claiming we are right, you are not right, although you believe, you Germans, that you are right. Maybe it's a question of communication. Mm -hmm. It's a question of diplomatic softness. If you know that you're doing the right thing, why should there be any need to be exaggerating in your assuredness of doing the right thing? Maybe this is one of the problems, but since I do not speak Hungarian, I cannot get uh, the, 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 the feeling or the, the flavor of uh, governmental uh, statements. The best person to answer this question is my dear friend Ben Sebauer. As a moderator, I am not entitled to answer questions from the auditorium. At SF, you have been kind enough to direct your question to me, and Professor Patzel did the same. I would like to give a personal opinion on, on this question. I think that uh, from the content and from the beliefs of the policymaking in Hungary, there are no fundamental uh, troubles, uh, in my view. In my view, there are uh, troubles to explain policies towards the European public. I think this is a question of communication, but this is also a question about to understand uh, how other people, how other countries in Europe understand developments, for example, in Hungary. They understand it maybe another way. And it also has something to do with our language. Uh, Professor Patzel mentioned it's very hard to learn Hungarian. And uh, if you know that Hungarian debates are maybe with some other rapidity, with some other, with some other uh, stress uh, done, like in the Western European countries, then you understand that it's hard for us Hungarians to explain what we want. I'm very self-critical on that. And our goal is, or my idea is in the Matthias Kovinus Collegium, we need to form also a generation that is in the debates in European countries, that is in the debates in other countries, to understand the processes, procedures, people, personalities, institutions, how discussions are done in other countries of Europe, especially in the Western part, where we are, we, by historical circumstances, uh, there's, there are two generations who couldn't participate in the debates of the Western European countries, couldn't participate in the debates of the founding fathers of the European Union, couldn't participate in the debates where it's normal for a German uh, to go to Erasmus to France since the 60s, 70s, 80s to have friendships. The Hungarians and the Central Eastern European countries have been deprived from this experience. So one of our ideas is to form also a new generation of talented youngsters who understand these debates, who are self-confident enough to go out to the outside world, to go to other countries and explain the position, explain why Hungarians are doing so like they are doing. And for this, we also need to understand them, but we also want them to understand us. And I think this uh, lies on mutual respect. And I, the reason why we have also this institute is to understand the processes of Germany, to understand the institutions, the people, the personalities, how are debates in other countries formed. And this is also our duty, I have to admit. So in this respect, uh, we can do more. Uh, communication is very important, and to be in the networks, to be in the processes within Europe. I think this is also very important. So to say a German, German uh, saying, uh, Recht haben und Recht bekommen, to ha you are on the, maybe on the right side, but you maybe are not able to communicate it in, in a manner that everybody understands what you want. I think this could be, could be uh, important for us. And um, I see no fundamental troubles as uh, the policies and as uh, the, the questions of the country, how the country is, is, is governed. But I see, uh, of course, uh, uh, room to improve in the way we have uh, uh, better communication and communication strategies and an output. I think this is an old question when we look in, in Hungarian debates. This is an old question when we look how Hungary was perceived and is perceived. And I have to say that the language is not helping. 
because uh, there are only very few who speak Hungarian, and we need to find the ways, the fora, the processes to communicate on all other levels of the European arena, so to say. I hope I managed to answer your question to a certain extent. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I think now uh, I have to drop in to my role as a moderator again. It's 6.30. I would like to thank you for your uh, interest. I would like to thank uh, Professor Patzelt for his uh, very good answers and his really interesting insights in uh, German politics. I think we learned a lot tonight. I personally learned a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Patzelt. I thank you for the interesting questions. I thank you for the uh, interest and I think I thank all others uh, behind the screens back home following us on Facebook who participated on this event. And I may now invite all the people present in the room uh, for a small reception in the next room. Thank you very much. I wish you a very Merry Christmas, a wonderful Happy New Year, and I very much hope to see you on the next events in the year 2022. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.